Dobry wieczór Państwu. Jest mi strasznie miło przywitać Państwa na ostatnim już z całej serii wykładów pana profesora Johna Matesona. Tym razem jest to wykład zatytułowany Alfa i Omega, czyli o wstępach i zakończeniach tekstów biograficznych. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome you to the last of the series of the lectures delivered by Professor John Madison. Uh, this one uh, is titled Alpha and Omega Writing, the Beginning and the End of a Biography. Proszę Państwa, przez ostatnie dwa miesiące mieliśmy wielką przyjemność wysłuchania całej serii wykładów oraz serii seminariów. Seminaria także otwarte odbywały się w języku angielskim i realizowane były na platformie Zoom Uniwersytetu Śląskiego, podczas gdy wykłady otwarte były tłumaczone symultanicznie i dostępne były na platformie Facebook Biblioteki Śląskiej, podczas gdy oryginał wykładu dostępny był przez kanał YouTube Biblioteki Śląskiej. Dzisiaj także w ten sposób działamy. Proszę Państwa, tekst wykładu, czy też wykład tłumaczony na język polski symultanicznie będzie dostępny na platformie Facebook Biblioteki Śląskiej, gdzie serdecznie zapraszamy. Natomiast tych z Państwa, którzy woleliby posłuchać wykładu w oryginale, zapraszamy na platformę YouTube Biblioteki Śląskiej, gdzie ten wykład będzie nietłumaczony. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past several weeks we had this enormous honor, enormous pleasure of uh, participating in a series of open seminars and open lectures delivered by Professor John Madison. Uh, the lecture, the seminars um, delivered in English were available and still are available on the Zoom platform of the University of Silesia in Katowice, while the open lectures that were uh, live interpreted into Polish uh, were delivered through the platform of the Library of Silesia, the, the, the Facebook platform of the University of, uh, of the Library of Silesia, while the original is available uh, on uh, um, through the uh, uh, YouTube channel of the library. Today as well, like in the past weeks, uh, we will be delivering the lecture in two languages. Uh, those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who prefer English are most welcome to switch to the YouTube platform uh, of the Library of Silesia and Karavica, while those of you who prefer Polish are most welcome to stay on the Facebook platform. I just wanted to uh, um, uh, um, remind you that the, the series of lectures and seminars was, has been sponsored by the uh, metropolis of Upper Silesia and Zagłębia in collaboration with the Library of Silesia and the University of Silesia and Karavica. Chciałem Państwu tylko przypomnieć, że zarówno wykłady otwarte, jak i seminaria otwarte sponsorowane były przez Górnośląsko-Zagłębiowską Metropolię i współorganizowane przez Uniwersytet Śląski oraz Bibliotekę Śląską w Katowicach. Panie i Panowie, w ostatnim wykładzie niniejszej serii Profesor Mateson odpowiada na podstawowe pytania, które decydują o kształcie tekstu biograficznego. W jaką relację ja, jako autor, wchodzę z przedmiotem mojego opisu? Na jakich zasadach wejdę w interakcję z moim czytelnikiem? Jak wyobrażałbym sobie reakcję mojego czytelnika na bohatera, którego w niej opisuję? I rozważając te kwestie, profesor Mateson będzie odsłaniał tajniki warsztatu biografa, ukazując z jednej strony konkretne funkcje pewnych rozwiązań stylistycznych w kluczowych miejscach tekstu, czyli na początku i na końcu, a z drugiej mechanizm emocjonalnej fuzji horyzontów biografa i innego człowieka, będącego obiektem jego zainteresowania. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last uh, lecture of this series, Professor Madison uh, is about to respond or answer uh, essential questions that decide about the shape of the biographical text. And these questions are, what is the relation between me as author with the subject of my description? What are the principles under which or on which uh, or following which uh, I uh, enter uh, into an interaction with my reader? How would I imagine the reaction of my reader to the uh, protagonist, to the hero that I describe? Uh, uh, exploring these issues, Professor Madison is going to uncover uh, some secrets of uh, the, the biographer's workshop, uh, demonstrating on the one hand particular functions of certain st stylistic solutions in the key locations of the text, which is the beginning and the end. And on the other hand, the mechanisms of the emotional fusion of the horizons of the biographer and the other person who is 
the object of his or her interest. Panie i panowie, prosiłbym teraz o to, żebyście państwo mieli 10, dali nam 10 sekund na przełączenie się na dwa kanały, a zaraz potem rozpoczniemy e, 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 nasz wykład. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would very much appreciate it if you could give us uh, 10 to 15 seconds for uh, the, the operators at the Library of Silesia to switch um, us into the two language channels, following which the floor is going to be Professor Madison's. And thank you again very, very much, Professor Ian Jacob. Thank you for um, all of your Yes, thank you for all of your assistance and encouragement um, during uh, the preparation and uh, presentation of these lectures. And, uh, and my thanks, of course, also to uh, the Upper Metropolis of Silesia, to the University of Silesia and the Library of Silesia for their very generous and enthusiastic support of the work that we've been doing. When I was um, just starting uh, to receive some recognition as a biographer, uh, one of the first events at which I was invited to speak was a kickoff event for a new Center for Biographical Studies in Midtown Manhattan. At the gathering, uh, which was entitled uh, Great Beginnings, the participants were each asked to come to the podium and to read aloud their favorite first paragraph from another author's biography. As I'll explain later in this lecture, I don't read very many biographies, and I had certainly read far fewer when this invitation came. You know, wanting to choose something really good, I plunged into the Columbia University Library in search of the ideal first biographical paragraph. Well, to be honest, I had trouble finding one that I really liked. Uh, even a number of respected biographies began with a variation on the same dry pro forma recitation. The subject had been born in Y city on X day in Z year. Well, pressed for time, I copied down one that was at least respectable, the opening of Herschel Parker's life of Herman Melville. I dutifully read it at the gala, still not feeling I had found what I was looking for. That evening, however, another biographer, the splendid David Levering Lewis, read a paragraph that I still admire as a work of art. The passage came from T. Harry Williams's biography of the Southern American politician and demagogue Huey Long, and it went like this. The story seems too good to be true, but people who should know swear that it is true. The first time that Huey P. Long campaigned in rural Latin Catholic South Louisiana, the local boss who had him in charge said at the beginning of the tour, Huey, you are to remember one thing in your speeches today. You're from North Louisiana, but now you're in South Louisiana. We got a lot of Catholic voters down here. I know, Huey answered, and throughout the day, in every small town, Long would begin by saying, when I was a boy, I would get up at six o'clock in the morning on Sunday, and I would hitch our old horse up to the buggy, and I would take our Catholic grandparents to Mass. I would bring them home, and at ten o'clock, I would hitch the old horse up again, and I would take my Baptist grandparents to church. Well, the effect of the anecdote on the audiences was obvious, and on the way back to Baton Rouge that night, the local leader said, admiringly, Why, Huey, you've been holding out on us. I didn't know you had any Catholic grandparents. Oh, don't be a damn fool, replied Huey. We didn't even have a horse. I had come to this gathering as an ostensible expert. I came away having learned some things of tremendous value. The T. Harry Williams paragraph illustrates in extraordinary fashion just how much important work can be done in the first few lines of a biography. Williams's paragraph achieves a surprising number of goals in what seems to be effortless fashion. Perhaps we can attempt to break down and examine the function of this paragraph. I would begin by noting that a biographer needs to bear in mind a trio of simultaneous relationships that he or she is obliged to cultivate. She must ask, how do I, the author, relate to my subject? 
On what terms shall I interact with my reader? And most importantly, how do I want my reader to respond to my subject? Within these three questions, further queries are also lurking, since people relate to one another in more than one way. For instance, how might one's intellectual regard for one's subject's achievements differ from one's feelings towards him or her? For example, it's entirely possible to adore the music of Richard Wagner and to despise him as a human being. A thorough biographer will want to present both the artistic genius and the personal repugnance. Uh, moreover, a biographer has another seemingly paradoxical task. It has always seemed to me that readers of biographies want two opposing things at the same time. They want to understand why the subject of the book is truly great and deserving of a biography, but they also want to feel a kind of human kinship with the subject. They want to sense that the subject, despite her or his greatness, is in some way just like them. I will speak in just a moment about how Williams responded to some of these um, authorial challenges, but first I would say a word or two about his subject, who was Huey Long, and why might American readers find him interesting? Well, Huey Long became famous in the 1920s and 30s, when he served first as governor of the southern state of Louisiana, and then later as one of Louisiana's United States senators. Nicknamed the Kingfish because of his enormous personality, he was a man whom polite people called controversial. A self-described populist, he declared his intention to make every man a king, he drastically improved and modernized the state's roads and bridges. He built a state hospital where he meant for everyone to receive free medical care. He instituted a huge program to supply free textbooks to Louisiana students. However, his methods for achieving reform were often horrifying. Bullying, swaggering, he rigged elections, swayed legislators with open threats, and silenced newspapers through intimidation. When the student newspaper of Louisiana State University criticized Long, he had the student editors expelled. While governor, he seized absolute control of the state's judiciary and its militia. When someone accused him of violating the state constitution, he replied, I'm the constitution around here now. People either loved or hated Huey Long. So then, how does Williams manage that triangle of relationships among author, subject, and audience? He begins, as we've seen, with a joke, one that enables Williams to suggest his disapproval of Long for being a shameless liar, but also to imply a certain affection for the politician's roguishness. By choosing a story that highlights the poverty of Long's childhood, a condition which, by the way, Long himself exaggerated, uh, Williams makes Long human and accessible, not so distant from the average reader in terms of class as to chill the reader's affections. Even here, of course, a contradiction is lurking. Long stresses his closeness to the common people, but he's perfectly comfortable with utterly deceiving them. Long's appearance as a casual liar also provides Williams with a contrast that helps to emphasize Williams' own trustworthiness as an author. Williams states at the outset that he considers his anecdote too good to be true. Unlike Long, he warns us that what he's about to tell us may be a lie. He's willing to share in Long's humor, but he will not descend to the same level of dishonesty. Long's own quoted remarks add to Williams' caveat. His retort to the local politician, don't be a damn fool, is also partly addressed to Williams' readers. We, too, will be damn fools if we trust whatever the kingfish tells us. Huey Long, as Williams presents him, is charming but a touch repellent, and the portrayal will darken as the chapters go by. There's a boyish, endearing quality to the governor's lies, and we don't mind the lie because it makes us laugh. We, uh, we feel at ease. We are entertained by Long, and Williams has gained our trust. We are just one paragraph into the biography, and Williams has us right where he wants us. A far different but equally effective stratagem was adopted by one of the greatest biographers in the English language, whom I at least have had the pleasure to meet, 
Richard Holmes in his life of the romantic poet Shelley, The Pursuit. To find a pathway into Shelley's awareness, Holmes evidently asked himself, what were the impressions of which Shelley himself first became aware? One of the first images that is etched in the mind of any child is the look of her or his room, or perhaps the view from that room's window. And it is with that first formative impression that Holmes begins writing a paragraph that I've shortened a bit for clarity. His bedroom window looked west towards the setting sun. There was a wide lawn with a shallow bank to roll down and then a cluster of enormous trees, elms with rooks in them, cedars, American redwoods brought back to England by his grandfather, and further and darker rhododendrons and fir trees. Through the trees was a lake, and beyond an even bigger lake, which was called Warnham Pond. His father kept a boat there and the fishing lines. In Warnham Pond there lived the great tortoise. Sometimes at night it rose out of the depth of the water and came trundling over the lawns. In the woods there was another monster, the great snake. He talked to the nurse about it. She said it lived in St. Leonard's Forest and was at least 300 years old. Sometimes he told his sister Elizabeth about the great tortoise and the great snake, and she was very frightened. But she was only two. The prose in this passion, passage is practically photographic, and it is as smooth as butter. It captures perfectly the mood of the hazy recollections of a boy who grows up in a fine house with a, a nurse to mind him and a forest to run in, beside mysterious waters from which the enormous creatures of one's fancy might emerge. Holmes describes the place in such a way that one can quickly grasp how such surroundings could spark an imagination that could mature into genius. At the same time, the paragraph is an oblique retelling of Genesis, offering an, an idyllic setting troubled by a threatening serpent. Also remarkable in the paragraph is the abrupt but somehow graceful turn from fact to fantasy. The tortoise and the snake enter the scene in perfectly casual fashion, as if it were the most natural thing in the world for immense reptiles to go charging across one's father's garden. The allusions to aquatic monsters also foretell, ever so slightly, the poet's death by drowning. Holmes's biography runs a daunting 733 pages, but with its enchanting start, it already wins the reader's loyalty. One of the luxuries of a lecture like this one is that it allows me to place myself for the better part of an hour alongside such masters of the craft as Williams and Holmes. It may well be that I have as much business next to them as a great tortoise had in Percy Shelley's pond, but I'll be referring to my own work in this lecture because, after all, I know my own creative process best. I can't really know what propelled the choices that Williams and Holmes made, but I can speak authoritatively about my own. I would begin by making a recommendation to would-be biographers that may go against their intuitions, and, um, uh, and that is, if possible, not to write the book's introduction first. I say, if possible, because your editor is almost certain to want you to write sequentially. Like any reader, an editor bases her understanding on a given, of a given chapter on what has gone before. It's hard for her to comment intelligently on chapter 6 if she has thus far no knowledge of chapter 5. Nevertheless, the task of writing is very different from the task of reading, and I would argue that it demands a different logic and very often a different creative order. Think for a moment, if you will, about how you introduce a friend or acquaintance to a third person. You'll be able to do it best if you know your acquaintance very well. The chances are that a biographer, even if she knows a lot about her subject at the outset, is going to know that subject several times better after two or three years on the job. And, as any biographer knows, one's ideas about one's subject are apt to change and grow much more complex as both the research and the work writing process continue. To take this idea a bit further, writing a biography can feel very much like an ongoing dialogue, 
between what you already know and what you are gradually learning and interpreting afresh. With, uh, rather as with a friend you're getting to know, you're in conversation with your subject, and that conversation is a process of discovery. If you write your introduction too soon, you run the risk of short-circuiting that process of discovery, or at least not letting it unfold as naturally as it should. You're likely to lock yourself into a concept of your subject that seems accurate, but which may be disproven by your further research. And it is very important to remain supple and open in your interpretations for as long as you possibly can. Bob Dylan wrote, I'll know my song well before I start singing. As in the song, so too in a well-written biography. A second reason for postponing the writing of introductions has to do with the way most writers write. That is, we tend to get stuck. I have probably never met a writer who, at one time or another, has not felt the frustration and creeping panic of what English speakers call writer's block. One of my most successful tactics in combating writer's block, especially on a project that will fill hundreds of pages, is to write the easy parts first. Do the part that most inspires you, or on which you have uh, more or less completed your research, or for which you have the clearest artistic vision. If you start on page one and try to write the whole book in sequence, you can run a serious risk of getting stuck not only on page two, but on page 23 and on page 57. When I was writing my first book, Eden's Outcasts, I was in particular need of making that large and unfamiliar task feel as comfortable as possible. I started not with the introduction, but with chapters five, six, and seven. They were the chapters I had researched first, and I had the clearest image of them in my mind. When they were done, I skipped ahead to chapter 11, my chapter about the American Civil War, uh, because I found that portion of the story particularly interesting. After that, I hit a wall. The winds of inspiration had died down to a whisper, and my sails went slack. I was angry with the Alcott family for having me taken thus far into the project and then abandoning ship. There was only one possible outlet for my wrath. I stopped fooling around with the middle of the book, shifted to the final chapter, and killed them all. Then, emotionally freed by my literary massacre, I went back to the introduction, which I now felt knowledgeable enough to write, and finished the book sequentially after that. One of the wonderful features of writing is that it does not demand any specified order. If you're an architect, you can't put the roof on first. But it is in the nature of writing that the writer is free to move about at will, choosing the sequence of tasks as he will, until the thing is finished. It's a glorious freedom, and a writer should not hesitate to make use of it. But to return to the writing of introductions. From the writer's viewpoint, one of the most useful functions of an introduction is to address and disarm any biases or non-productive preconceptions that a reader may be expected to have about your subject. In each of my books, I've done this, though each time the move has been somewhat different. My first book, as you know, was a uh, dual biography of Bronson and Louisa May Alcott. Louisa is one of those naturally endearing persons who needs no special gilding to make her highly presentable and appealing to an audience. Her father, however, posed a problem. Bronson Alcott was a devoted parent and a spellbinding speaker who impressed people with the unusual purity of his moral character. Unfortunately, his ethics were so far above those of the everyday marketplace that he often refused to lower himself into it. He scorned most ordinary ways of making money, and his disastrously poor grasp of simple economics threw his family into desperate poverty. As a teenager, Louisa complained in her diary that the family was poor as rats. Now, American readers will forgive a hero a great many faults. Failure in business, however, coupled with an apparent unwillingness to try to succeed, is not one of them.
I've met countless people who adore Louisa and express utter contempt for her ne'er-do-well father, Bronson. I knew, therefore, that I would have to write an introduction that created sympathy for Bronson uh, as quickly and as convincingly as possible. I started, therefore, with an emotionally moving moment. The time is the early weeks of the financial panic of 1837. Bronson Alcott, deep in debt and with the school he has founded teetering on the edge of ruin, has been forced to sell off his beloved personal library. I begin with a description of the auction. Bearing in mind the fact that relatively few readers have heard of Bronson Alcott, the prologue to Eden's Outcast also briefly situates him among the more illustrious writers whom he knew and also influenced, Emerson, Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and of course, Alcott's own daughter, Louisa. At the same time that my introduction tries to play a sympathetic note, it also introduces a whiff of scandal. Without offering too much detail, and making it clear that Alcott engaged in no impropriety by modern standards, I note that Alcott's school was failing because of a public outcry over his classroom discussions relating to sex. Sympathy, extraordinary colleagues, and a mild taste of the lurid. This was the recipe I used to pique the reader's interest at the start of Eden's Outcasts. When I was starting my biography of Margaret Fuller, I had different problems to address. One was organizational. Although Fuller lived only 40 years, her life was exceptionally complex with a variety of twists and turns, both in circumstance and in the development of her character. Narrating such a life, to say nothing of introducing it, would require consummate skill. The other problem with Fuller was with the nature and notoriety of her tragic death. If an educated American knows anything about Margaret Fuller, and many educated Americans know nothing about her, it's likely the fact that she perished in a shipwreck in the midst of a freak hurricane. The death was so spectacular that I was afraid it might overshadow the story of her life. I solved the organizational problem one afternoon when I was in a clothing store with my daughter, and she was trying on pairs of blue jeans. As I waited, I started thinking about Fuller's life as a process of trying on metaphorical garments, that is, passing through a succession of various identities. At a time when a woman's lack of opportunities forced her to become a kind of chameleon, trying always to adapt to new circumstances that she often lacked the power to change, Fuller was constantly compelled to try out new roles and occupations as a means of survival. Before I knew it, I had my thesis and my title, The Lives of Margaret Fuller. To address the problem of Fuller's early spectacular death, I decided to address the matter head on. Quickly, there came to my mind the East Coker section of the poet T.S. Eliot's majestic work, Four Quartets. That section begins, in my end, oh, please forgive me, in my beginning is my end. I began my introduction to Fuller with the line, which stands alone as a paragraph, think first of endings. I continue. Margaret Fuller was, in her time, the best read woman in America, and one of the most renowned for her intelligence. She was the leading female figure in the New England movement known as Transcendentalism. She edited the first avant-garde intellectual magazine in America. As a literary critic, she was rivaled in her era only by Edgar Allan Poe. Three years before the convention that is usually regarded as the beginning of the women's rights movement in the United States, she wrote a groundbreaking book demanding legal equality for women. And yet, if the ordinary person today knows only one thing about Margaret Fuller, that particle of knowledge is likely not to concern any of her achievements, but how her life came to an end. At the age of only 40, having spent almost three and a half years in Europe as foreign correspondent for the New York Tribune, Fuller sailed back to America with the husband she had met in Rome, Marchese Giovanni Ossoli, and their young son, Angelino. That new life never began. On July 19th, 
1850, within sight of land, the ship on which the Osolis were traveling struck a sandbar off the coast of Fire Island, New York. The ship broke apart and sank. None of the Osolis survived. This was how Margaret Fuller became ingrained in our history, not as the sparkling conversationalist enlivening the bookstores of Boston with her wit and erudition, not as the impromptu military nurse giving aid and encouragement to freedom fighters in the streets of Rome, not even as the accomplished and dedicated scholar churning out a stunning body of literary criticism and social commentary, but as a forlorn, exhausted figure beside a broken mast, her hands on her knees, clad only in a soaked through nightgown, soon to feel the wave that would thrust her overboard and into eternity. Although the introduction to the lives of Margaret Fuller also explains the idea of narr narrating her existence as a series of lives, it also confesses its limitations. Here's a paragraph I especially enjoyed crafting. This conception of Fuller is admittedly imperfect. Her various identities did not arise in a tidy succession, and they often overlapped. The intended effect is not literal, but metaphorical. By representing Fuller as a series of metaphoric selves, this book hopes to reveal the impossibility of reducing Fuller to a single label. The telling of Fuller's story should be prismatic. If one cannot recreate the unitary light of her existence, one should at least strive to offer up a rainbow. My introduction to my Fuller biography gives the reader a peek behind the stage set. It explains my thinking in presenting Fuller as a series of lives and thus provides a glimpse of the author's craft at work. My idea was to take the reader into my confidence to show her or him a bit about how the thing is done. It's another way of getting the reader on one side. The novelist Ernest Hemingway is quoted as saying that all true stories end in death. Certainly, his statement is true regarding most biographies. Only rarely does a serious biography end while the subject is still alive, and those that do are rarely of the highest quality. An exception among American biographies, by the way, is Robert A. Caro's brilliant volume, The Power Broker. Uh, biography, which is literally the writing of life, typically ends as the writing of death. It's always seemed to me that the end of a biography draws upon some of a writer's deepest skills. For one thing, the narration of death, an event so naturally laden with feelings, calls for a fine sense of the elegiac and a feel for emotional climax. A fine biography calls for a forceful ending. It's hardly a coincidence that both of my first two biographies deal with subjects whose departures from life had more than ordinary drama. Although I've written many critical essays on Herman Melville, I will never write Melville's biography, in large part because the dramatic arc of his life lacks an appealing shape. He writes his great book at 32. After that, his life gradually declines until he dies forgotten 40 long years later. The anticlimax is just too daunting for me to try to overcome. When advising new biographers in search of a subject, I always advise them to look for a life with a slam-bang ending. When Louisa May Alcott visited her dying father, he eerily asked her to come up with him. Three days later, he died. Before the news reached Louisa, she felt a headache, lay down, and lost consciousness. She died two days later, on the same day as her father's funeral. As for Margaret Fuller, I have already mentioned that she drowned in a terrible shipwreck at the age of 40. I felt that it took little effort on my part to properly dramatize these passings. They were already great stories. For Margaret Fuller's death scene, I took as my inspiration her last words, as wind and waves swept the deck of her doomed ship. She said, I see nothing but death before me. I shall never reach the shore. Responding to these words, I wrote, Margaret Fuller always explained and justified her life by its next step. With her, uh, with her ever unfolding discoveries and ambitions, she gave a coherency to what had gone before and an anticipation to what was to come.
The logic of her life was supplied by her insatiable desire to change, to progress, to keep moving. It's both fitting and chilling that almost the last words she was ever heard to say were, I see nothing but death before me. If any idea would have been intolerable to Margaret Fuller, it was the absence of a future, for without a future, nothing about her made a particle of sense. Her lifelong belief that, through adversity, she would always grow, progress, and prevail died moments before she did. The paragraph I've just read to you enabled me to both bring Fuller to her end and also to summarize the basic ethic of her life. Uh, it tries to evoke the despair not only of dying, but also of the loss and of the knowledge of great deeds left undone. After the death of the subject, the biographer stands naked and alone, with nothing to separate him or her any more from the audience. The biographer's partnership with the subject has ended, and he must somehow finish the task of writing on his own. There are no more stories to tell. He has only his skill as an artist to fall back on. Little wonder, then, that a biographer of uncertain skill often writes the end as soon as possible after the subject's body hits the floor. But to take the easiest way out seems to me unfair to the subject. During the writing of the book, the author has gone through a great deal at the subject's side. Doesn't he owe the subject a proper send-off? Indeed, the only circumstance in which I would consider ending a biography at the instant of the subject's death would be the case where the subject is a contemptible villain or a malevolent clown, a Hitler or a Donald Trump, deserving to be thrown onto the dunghill of history without a word of commemoration. Most often, however, biographers choose subjects whom they like, and the ending of the life story then becomes an interesting challenge. In biography, there is a poetics of the ending, though the application of that poetics changes with every different subject, simply because the subjects themselves differ. As with stage tragedy, the dramatic goal of the ending is to bring closure and catharsis, though it can be interesting if the ending opens up another vista. To write an ending effectively, a biographer must be aware of the central theme that has supported the book from the beginning. In other words, what is the most essential dramatic tension in the work, the idea that the author most needs either to resolve or to raise to an additional level of conflict? An excellent way to end a biography is to propose an answer to a question that has likely been on the reader's mind from the start. What does the subject of the biography mean to us now? Two biographers who excel at placing their subjects in relation to relevancy to the current moment are David W. Blight, the author of Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, and T.J. Stiles, author of Custer's Trials, A Life on the Frontier of a New America. Douglas, who daringly escaped from slavery at the age of 20, became Black America's most forceful and eloquent advocate for the abolition of slavery. Douglas wrote his own life story not once, not twice, but three times, and his 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, is now recognized as one of the outstanding orations of 19th century America. Blight's book is concerned with Douglas's current meaning from its first page. He begins by citing a speech by Barack Obama that alludes to Douglas's legacy. Blight concludes by referring again to our own experience, this time in soaring eulogistic prose. Douglas was the prose poet of America's and perhaps of a universal body politic. He searched for the human soul, envisioned through slavery and freedom in all their meanings. He, there had been no other voice quite like Douglas's. He inspired adoration and rivalry, love and loathing. His work and his words still wear well. What shall we make of our Douglas in our own time? The problem of the 21st century is still some agonizingly enduring combination of legacies leading forth from slavery and color lines. Freedom in its infinite meanings remains humanity's most universal aspiration. 
Douglas's life, and especially his words, may forever serve as our watch warnings in our unending search for the beautiful, needful thing. Blight's volume is of mammoth size. The words I just quoted appear on page 764. After such a long exploration, it could not have been easy to pin down just a couple of characteristics to sum up the significance of Douglas. For Blight, two aspects of Douglas stand out, his love of freedom and the eloquence that he used to make himself an embodiment of liberty. Highlighting those two features was all Blight needed to do to produce a memorable finale. To finish his book on the um, frontiersman and Indian fighter George Armstrong Custer, T.J. Stiles had to contend with a mythology that is so thick that it almost obscures his subject from view. Custer is one of those figures whom everyone recognizes but whom few really know. Because of his famous last stand against the Sioux Indians in which he and his entire regiment were killed in 1876, Custer is one of the foremost legends of the American West, portrayed in countless movies and misrepresented by innumerable tall tales. In the mind of the average American, the name of Custer is present, but only as a cartoon. Stiles' book sets out to erase the caricature, but he's smart enough to know that it really can't be done. Even if 50 scrupulously accurate biographies of Custer were to appear tomorrow, the misconceptions surrounding him would survive intact. Stiles therefore ends with a very cagey ploy. He ends not with Custer, but with his widow. Elizabeth Bacon Custer had become what Stiles calls a professional widow never remarrying, fighting to the end to preserve the idealized public image of her late husband. She died in 1933, not in the West that Custer had tried to tame, but in an apartment on Park Avenue in New York. Stiles' closing comments are superb. It's fitting that she lived out her life in New York. When given a choice, Custer had always picked the footlights over a campfire. Broadway over the open plains, much as he sincerely loved the latter. Young men might go west, but Manhattan forged the corporate technological future. Its vitality and promise drew Custer to it, yet he never mastered it. His sudden offstage ending left him suspended forever between east and west, past and future, to be misremembered as needed by each new generation. Embedded in Stiles' words is the awareness that the classic American West has become so much a possession of Hollywood that it is now impossible to think of it without imagining some kind of show. It is the Broadway stage, Netflix, and MGM pictures that shape the American consciousness of the past, not the scholarly biographer. Stiles also contrives at the end of his biography to stretch Custer in all dimensions, in the author's prose, the iconic Indian fighter inhabits both West and East, past and future. And, says Stiles, his legacy is infinitely malleable, ready to be distorted as suits the wishes and agendas of every rising generation. In my first book, Eden's Outcasts, the central problem of the text is the relationship between the two title characters, Louisa May Alcott and her father. I had told the story of how a brilliant but infuriatingly placid and impractical man had raised and responded to a restless, energetic, and highly mercurial daughter. It's a tale of how two family members of opposite temperaments initially clashed with, but after passing through poverty, illness, and war, eventually reconciled with each other. I wanted to end the book on that note of reconciliation. Before I knew anything else that I wanted to say in the last paragraph of that book, I knew that it had to end with two words expressing mutuality and equality, each other. Also, um, like as I imagine most biographers, I was nearing the end of my task with a sense of insufficiency. I wished that I had known more and that I had written better. Thus, I also thought it would be honest to end with a brief reflection on the limits of biography, 
how the story we most wish to tell is often the tacit unspoken one that the surviving evidence only hints at. And so then, the last paragraph of Eden's Outcasts. To the extent that a written page permits knowledge of a different time and departed souls. This book has tried to reveal them. However, as Bronson Alcott learned to his bemusement, the life written is never the same as the life lived. Journals and letters tell much. Biographers can sift the sands as they think wisest. But the bonds that two persons share consist also of encouraging words, a reassuring hand on a tired shoulder, fleeting smiles, and soon forgotten quarrels. These contacts, so indispensable to human existence, leave no durable trace. As writers, as reformers, and as inspirations, Bronson and Louisa still exist for us. Yet this existence, on whatever terms we may experience it, is no more than a shadow when measured against the way they existed for each other. Ending the lives of Margaret Fuller called not for reconciliation, but for inspiration. Dying so young, Fuller left a tremendous amount of work undone. Her dream of bringing true equality to women, though now much more fully realized than in her own time, still calls out for completion. Fuller took delight in inspiring others, in exhorting them to rise to forms and levels of accomplishment that she could only point toward. In concluding my biography, I wanted to issue a friendly challenge to my readers. They had read the story of Fuller's fight for freedom and democracy. It should now be their turn to act. And so I wrote. As her friend James Freeman Clark observed, much of Margaret Fuller's work was in showing other people the unique power and genius in themselves. And once they had discovered that uniqueness, giving them the urging, the cajoling, and the love that they required to bring their own greatness into the world. In the minds of people who continue to discover Fuller, that work goes on. This book began with the assertion that Margaret Fuller's life was her most remarkable creation. It is just possible, however, that her most wonderful creations may still lie in the future. Fuller's most precious gift to us may reside in the ideas and the works still yet to be imagined of men and women who follow her example. We may decide that, despite all that Margaret Fuller endured and suffered in order to become exceptional, her life, or rather her lives, well deserve imitating. And I concluded with the chiastic echo of the book's first line, think last of beginnings. As I said toward the beginning of my remarks, I don't read a lot of biographies. For a very long time, my preferred reading has been works of fiction, especially those by women and men who are acknowledged geniuses in the field. I not only find fiction more gratifying to read, but also more useful to me as I try continuously to adjust and improve my own writing style. The problem lies with the generally low expectations that surround the biographical genre. I've never taken a survey, but it seems to me that far too many readers pick up a biography only to be informed. They don't really expect to be entertained, and they certainly don't expect to encounter lively, carefully wrought prose. Accordingly, the rewards for writing a biography with some literary merit can be small perhaps a passing acknowledgement in a review or two that one's work is, quote, well written, unquote, or to use a phrase that has always annoyed me, quote, a good read, unquote. Yet the personal quiet satisfactions of craftsmanship have their own value. And when appreciation does come, it can come in marvelously unexpected ways. Some months after publishing Eden's Outcasts, I received a letter from a doctor somewhere in the American Middle West. He wrote to say that in the past two years, he had lost both his wife and a beloved daughter. He wanted to tell me that my book had helped him to heal and to reconnect with life. He thanked me profusely. He didn't explain just how my work had facilitated his rebirth, but I did not need to know. A good writer, I think, writes because of a desire to give. It is always a joy to know that someone else 
has received. Dziękuję pięknie panu profesorowi Matesonowi. Chciałbym państwa poprosić, zaprosić do zadawania pytań. Ladies and gentlemen, thanking Professor Madison profusely for his gift of the lecture, I would like to welcome your questions, uh, to which Professor Madison will be very happy uh, to provide answers. Don't be shy. Nie obawiajcie się Państwo, można zadawać pytania. Pan profesor Mateson chętnie na nie odpowie. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, don't be shy. Uh, Professor Madison will be very happy to answer these questions. Um, in, the, uh, in the meantime, um, um, if you allow me, Professor Madison, I'd like to ask a question. Great, looking forward. If, uh, knowing um, that you know, we've been friends forever. <laughs> Knowing, assuming that, assuming that I know you very, very well. If I chose to write your biography and you would choose to, to write your own autobiography, which of the two texts would be more reliable? Let me translate this into Polish. Panie profesorze, ponieważ znamy się bardzo długo, znamy się świetnie, to możemy zabawić się tak intelektualnie w taką grę. Załóżmy, że ja piszę biografię pana, biografię pana profesora, a równolegle pan profesor pisze swoją własną autobiografię. Który z tych dwóch tekstów byłby bardziej miarodajny? I, um, I think that I would probably trust you more than I would trust myself. Sądzę, że ufałbym tobie bardziej niż ufam sobie. Um, I, I think that all kinds of barriers arise when one tries to um, to view oneself, um, and um, and and I think that um, you know the perceptions of a trusted friend uh, can often be more revealing than than one's own pronouncements about oneself. Now, Just in an autobiography. Czasami, czasami, kiedy myśli się o sobie, pojawiają się różnego rodzaju problemy. Zdarza się często, być może perspektywa dobrego przyjaciela, perspektywa kogoś z zewnątrz jest bardziej miarodajna i właściwsza niż ta, którą wytwarzamy sami o sobie. Być może z twojego stwierdzenia... Być może stwierdzenia... Być może stwierdzenia jakiegoś zewnętrznego są bardziej e, 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 godne zaufania niż te e, e, wypowiedzi czy prawdy o sobie, które, 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 które sami pokazujemy, sami ukazujemy. Okay. Now it's arguable that in a bio, autobiography um, I might give you more access to my inner thoughts and to my psychological processes than any external observer could possibly observe. Um, go ahead and translate that. I'll continue. Być może w autobiografii byłbym w stanie dać czytelnikowi dostęp, otworzyć czytelnikowi dostęp, lepszy dostęp do moich najgłębszych myśli, do, do moich naj, 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 najgłębszych rozważań, przemyśleń. Być może w stopniu szerszym, głębszym, większym, niż mogłoby się to zdarzyć w przypadku twórcy zewnętrznego, biografa, który nie jest mną. Speaking about which, don't, is it, isn't that what you're reconstructing uh, while writing about Louisa May Alcott and Bronson no, Alcott? No. Isn't that what you're doing when writing about Margaret Fuller? Actually, no. when you read those texts, no, I'm, the, well, the, I'm not the, done yet. The I'd, I'd, are I'd like to say a little bit more, if I may. Ah, um, and, and, that, okay. and, and, and that is that um, uh, autobiographies um, often are written with um, untrustworthy motives. Um, they can be vehicles of self-congratulation. They can be attempts at self-therapy. Um, you know, and, and these motivations don't necessarily lead to, uh, to the best of, of works. There have been countless wonderful, beautiful lives lived 
there are really only a handful of, of good autobiographies. Mm -hmm. A problem polega też na tym, że autobiografia często może być powodowana niekoniecznie uczciwymi, niekoniecznie jasnymi motywami. Bardzo często autobiografia staje się, staje się nośnikiem ego stanowi pewną, może być stanowić, stanowić pewną formą wywyższania siebie samego, może stanowić pewną formę, formę autoterapii. E, istnieje bardzo wiele autobiografii e, na rynku wydawniczym, ale niewiele z nich to tak naprawdę autobiografie dobre. Hmm? Very fine. Okay. Okay, here's the question uh, asked by Dr. Thomas 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 Grzonślewicz. What uh, novels or short stories uh, would you recommend uh, for uh, for a would-be biographer to read if this would-be biographer wanted to uh, polish correct their own writing style? Uh, okay, that's that's a that it, it's an interesting question because. I would possibly recommend different authors for style than I would recommend for uh, biographical insight. Um, so the the um, some of the stylistic models that I've always looked up to are John Ruskin, George Orwell, and John Steinbeck. Uh, these are the the writers in English who um, from whom I've learned most in crafting my style. I have more, but you can go, go ahead with that. To jest trudne pytanie, dlatego że poleciłbym innych twórców, gdy chodzi o szlifowanie samych umiejętności biograficznych i innych, gdy chodzi o język, czyli o, o formalne kwestie związane ze stylem. Gdy chodzi o mistrzów stylu, to chciałbym polecić Johna Raskina, chciałbym polecić George'a Orwella i Johna Steinbecka. To są pisarze na których można byłoby się wzorować, też mogliby być wzorcami doskonałego biograficznego, biograficznego stylu. Jest więcej. As far, okay. Jest więcej, okay. ale, ale, as, ale as far as, uh, pisarzy. Uh, yeah, as, as far as uh, psychological insight goes, uh, I would suggest um, Virginia Woolf, who interestingly you know, was the, the daughter of a great biographer. Uh, and um, and Henry James uh, comes to mind um, you know, in terms and and Melville to a certain extent as well uh, people who had um, you know, and Dostoevsky Proust uh, people who have just uncanny insight into uh, uh, the, the 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 secrets and sometimes dark places of human motivation. Gdy chodzi o wgląd psychologiczny, poleciłbym Virginia Woolf, która, i to nie przez przypadek, dlatego że ona przecież była córką też znamienitego biografa, ale także Hermana Melvilla, ale także Marcela Prusta. To, to, to były postaci, które, których umiejętność wglądu w zakamarki ludzkiej duszy była niewyobrażalna którzy robili to w sposób niedościgniony. Panie i panowie, zapraszamy do zadawania pytań. Um, here's, a, here's a question by Dr. Karen, McLean, Karen Jane McLean. Your sharing of the non-chronological writing of Eden's Outcast has renewed my curiosity. How did you go about writing all five figures' stories into one in your most recent book? Uh, let me translate this into Polish. Kiedy dzieliłeś się swoją techniką jakby odejścia od chronologii w pisaniu Eden's Outcast, czyli Knights of Edenu, odświeżyłeś moją ciekawość. Jak radziłeś sobie z napisaniem biografii wszystkich pięciu postaci, którym poświęcasz swoją najnowszą książkę? Um, yes, in writing the new book, I was... Um... Uh, I was attempting to find a kind of balance among the five figures, uh, maybe a little bit like an Alexander Calder mobile. Um, you know, I, I had transcendental voices, I had pragmatic voices, I had um, uh, you know, a, a young Confederate hero to counterbalance um, you know, people who fought for the Union. Um, and 
and also I was trying to structure the book in a way that would um, you know, maintain a constant flow of interest. You know, one of the joys of having five heroes instead of one or two was that I could write cliffhangers at the end of chapters uh, and you know, take the story to a moment of exciting crisis and then cut away um, for, for a few uh, for a few chapters, um, so um, so it was it was it was fun to write in in that regard. Um, w przypadku mojej najnowszej książki e, staram się zachować jakiś rodzaj równowagi, e, rodzaj równowagi, m, który w moim przypadku wynikał z tego, że miałem tutaj do czynienia z różnymi perspektywami, e, egzystencjalną, transcendentalną. E, miałem tam bohaterów wojennych, miałem tam bohaterów literackich, e, więc starałem się. E, m, m, działać tak, żeby zachować pewnego rodzaju napięcie, żeby czytelnik cały czas był zainteresowany moją historią. A jedną z zalet pisania biografii pięciu osób naraz, a nie na przykład jednej czy dwóch, jest to, że mogłem sobie pozwolić na to, żeby stosować taką technikę suspensu na końcu każdego z rozdziałów, jakby zawieszając akcję w momencie interesującym i przechodząc do innego momentu. Troszkę taką kinową techniką cutscenek czy cutawayów po prostu. Zawieszenie i przejście do czegoś innego. Tak się starałem to robić i, i, i sprawiało mi to dużą przyjemność. Okay. Panie i panowie, zapraszamy pytania. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're most welcome to continue asking questions. It's, it's a lot of fun for, for the both of us. Uh, and Dr. Karen J. McLean, uh, where did you start and did you write all of one figure's materials, material first or did you switch back and forth? Gdzie, jak rozpocząłeś? Czy, I czy pisałeś biografię każdej z tych postaci na podstawie materiału opracowanego dla każdej z nich z osobna? A czy też było to tak, że przestawiałeś się z jednej na drugą pisząc? Um, it's actually hard to recollect, even though I wrote it fairly recently. Właściwie, uh, same właściwie, właściwie nie pamiętam, szczerze powiedziawszy, mimo że napisałem tę książkę w końcu niedawno. Ale w odróżnieniu od poprzednich książek pracowałem pod troszkę, pod nieco większą, znacznie większą presją ze strony redaktora, dlatego że redaktor wymagał ode mnie tym razem, być może z tego powodu, że, 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 że sam projekt był bardziej skomplikowany, bardziej złożony, abym oddawał mu fragmenty w kolejności, w odpowiedniej sekwencji, co musiałem czynić, skutkiem czego decydowało to o, o kierunku podejmowanych przeze mnie, przeze mnie działań właśnie tych związanych także z badaniami nad materiałem. Even as I was beginning to write the project, I already knew quite a bit about each of the five figures. So it was fairly easy for me to get um, you know, at, at least an outline in place and, uh, and a, a, a sort of a sketchy draft uh, before I, I, I you know, tackled it in, in full dress, if you will. Jednak było to dla mnie o tyle prostsze zadanie już w, poprzednich, w przypadku poprzednich książek, że kiedy zaczynałem pracować nad tym projektem, naprawdę dużo już wiedziałem o każdym z bohaterów, więc łatwiej było mi, łatwiej było mi pracować w pewnej sekwencji, w pewnej kolejności. Łatwiej było mi na przykład stworzyć konspekt tego projektu już od samego początku. Byłem w o, 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 o wiele wygodniejszej sytuacji niż w przypadku poprzednich biografii, które pisałem, ponieważ znaczna część tego materiału, który potem trafił do książki, to był materiał, który opracowałem już wcześniej i bardzo dogłębnie. Yeah. However, you know, it, even in spite of the, uh, the proddings of my editor, um, I, I do uh, recall uh, bouncing back and forth among chapters quite a bit and, um, and you know, even you know, writing down in a little grid, you know, what did I still have to do? And it was uh, you know, great fun to gradually check off you know, chapter three 
chapter eight, chapter fifteen, uh, as uh, as as the uh, uh, the end of the project approached. Ale mimo tych nacisków ze strony redaktora i tak przypominam sobie, że skakałem między jednym rozdziałem a drugim czasami po wielokroć i sprawiało mi dużą przyjemność takie odkreślanie tego, co już jest zrobione. Rozdział trzeci gotowy, rozdział czwarty gotowy, rozdział ósmy gotowy i dawało mi to dużą satysfakcję bez względu na sekwencyjność czy brak tej sekwencyjności. Szanowni Państwo, serdecznie zapraszamy do zadawania pytań. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be shy, please um, ask questions. We'll be more than happy. Um, well, John will be more than happy to answer and I'll be more than happy to translate. Now I'm worried that you're going to be writing my biography, Pavel. Well, that would be the, that would be a challenge. <laughs> Szanowni Państwo, ladies and gentlemen, if there uh, are no further questions, um, uh, allow me to uh, express my and yours profuse thanks to Professor John Madison for agreeing uh, to share his knowledge and experience with us in this very beautiful series of lectures and seminars that have been made available to the general public and uh, to the interested students of uh, um, all the university schools of the region and outside of it as well. Uh, and uh, to express my most sincere hope that this is not the last project, but just the first of many that we could possibly um, do together. Uh, hopefully that next time uh, Um, the contact between Professor Madison and you, ladies and gentlemen, might be a live contact, a face-to-face -face contact. Let's just keep our fingers crossed for the COVID to finally abate and uh, let's hope for this to happen. Panie i Panowie, ponieważ nie ma, nie widzę dalszych pytań, pozwólcie Państwo, że w własnym i Waszym imieniu najserdeczniej podziękuję Panu Profesorowi Johnowi Matesonowi za to, że zechciał podzielić się swoją ogromną wiedzą i doświadczeniem zarówno w czasie tych otwartych seminariów, jak i w czasie otwartych wykładów, z których mogli korzystać wszyscy zainteresowani nie tylko z regionu, ale także z całego świata. Mam nadzieję, bardzo głęboko i mam nadzieję, że też jestem wyrażając ją Państwa nadziei wyrazicielem, że ten projekt, który właśnie dobiega końca jest tylko pierwszym z wielu i liczę na to najserdeczniej, że przy kolejnym projekcie, kiedy będziecie mogli Państwo wejść we współpracę z Panem Profesorem Matesonem, ta współpraca będzie już współpracą na żywo, a nie online'ową. Liczmy więc na to, że COVID się wreszcie skończy. I kiedy się skończy, że spotkamy się wszyscy razem na sali wykładowej. Uh, using this opportunity, I'd like to express my most sincere thanks uh, to the uh, metropolis of Upper Silesia and Zagłębie, who sponsored the series of lectures and seminars, to uh, uh, um, the Library of Silesia, um, especially in particular uh, to Professor Zbigniew Kadulbek, który, uh, to, who, who's uh, uh, made it possible uh, um, for this series of lectures to happen, to uh, um, uh, Monika Wieczorek, without whose help it would never ever have happened, uh, to the whole technical crew who made the translations, uh, who made the, the live, live interpreting possible, Kudos, many, many, many thanks. Uh, our sincere, most sincere thanks go to uh, Dr. Tomasz Dronślewicz, who made, who made uh, uh, um, the series of seminars possible and who organized not only the whole uh, uh, distribution of information, but also uh, a very good uh, uh, piece of software that allowed us to not only deliver the lectures, but also to record them and to register them. Uh, Szanowni Państwo, pozwólcie mi wobec tego podziękować także Wszystkim tym, bez których ta seria wykładów i ta seria seminariów nie mogłaby nigdy się odbyć. Czyli chciałbym w imieniu swoim własnym oraz pana profesora Matesona podziękować Górnośląsko-Zagłębieskiej Metropolii za to, że umożliwiła nam doprowadzenie do, do tej serii wykładów i, i seminariów. Chcieliśmy najserdeczniej podziękować Bibliotece Śląskiej, panu dyrektorowi Zbigniewowi Kadłubkowi, panu profesorowi Kadłubkowi, pani Monice Wieczorek, wszystkim tym osobom, które umożliwiły 
umożliwił nam skorzystanie z niewiarygodnej zupełnie technologii umożliwiającej nam tłumaczenie na żywo, co pozwoliło utrzymać te wykłady w odpowiedniej formule czasowej. Chcieliśmy strasznie podziękować panu doktorowi Tomaszowi Grząślewiczowi, który umożliwił nam przeprowadzenie całej serii seminariów, także otwartych, nie tylko przeprowadzenie ich, ale także zarejestrowanie ich. Proszę Państwa, bez Waszej pomocy i bez Waszego wsparcia nic po prostu by się nie odbyło, nic by nie było możliwe. Finally, uh, uh, and I believe that Professor Madison is going to support me in that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our wonderful audience for their attentiveness, for all the fantastic questions that were asked, that uh, actually opened up the space for the new discussions, for the new debates. Uh, it is this kind of interaction that makes us uh, uh, wiser and better people. Szanowni Państwo, chcieliśmy w końcu podziękować wszystkim Państwu za udział w tych wykładach, za udział w tych seminariach, za zadawanie bardzo dobrych i mądrych pytań, które powodują, że my sami jesteśmy lepsi i mądrzejsi. Bez Państwa to wszystko nie miałoby sens. Professor Madison, perhaps you might want to say a few words to round it all up. Oh my goodness, um, I'm, I'm a bit taken by surprise. Um, well, I, I come to the end of, 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 of this work with, um, with a deep feeling of, of gratitude, and that gratitude goes in many different directions. It goes certainly to you. It goes to the fabulous technical staff um, that uh, wrestled courageously with some problems and, uh, and, and did really a, a spectacular job. Um, and uh, and also, I should uh, send my appreciation to uh, uh, to my current temporary academic home, which is uh, the University Jean Monnet in uh, Saint Etienne, uh, France, uh, where uh, I, I have felt not only like a guest, but uh, but actually uh, like um, a true inhabitant and a true citizen. Um, my my list of of, uh, of thanks could go on and on, really. And uh, um, but um, you know, in you know, in, in the final analysis, my my thanks go again, um, Professor Yenjeko, to you. Thank you very much. Szanowni Państwo, nadchodzi ten moment, kiedy trzeba się pożegnać. Jeszcze raz najpiękniej wszystkim z Państwa dziękujemy i miejmy nadzieję, że w niedługim czasie uda nam się spotkać po raz kolejny. A w międzyczasie będziemy się starać z panem profesorem Matesonem, żeby te wykłady, które się tutaj pojawiły, ukazały się także w formie drukowanej, co miejmy nadzieję, uda nam się wynegocjować. Ladies and gentlemen, um, there always comes a moment when it's time to say goodbye. And this is exactly this moment. We're just hoping that uh, the series of lectures and seminars that Professor Madison was so kind to deliver to all of us uh, will see the light of day in the printed form, both in English and this would be an ebook by John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And uh, um, in the Polish language, uh, if we can successfully negotiate that, uh, and uh, we hope that to be, to be able to deliver those to you as soon as possible. Ms. Uh, Agata Cichy has expressed her thanks to you as well. Thank you very much. Dziękujemy Pani Pięknie. Bardzo dziękuję. Życzymy Państwu dobrej nocy. We wish you a wonderful night, and thank you very much. Dobranoc.